even have, as he mentioned, one of the copies out here, which are, we have three copies. They don't, they're not, they're, I, this is the first time I saw it yesterday, actually. And I don't even get to keep one of the copies myself. I'm giving them all out today. <laughs> so uh, I won't actually get my copy until sometime later. So, uh, it's exciting for me as well, because it's the first time I've actually seen the thing in paper. So good day and welcome. My name is Brendan. I'm here to talk about the systems performance book. And what is systems performance? It is the analysis of everything, of applications down to metal. And think lamp, not amp. So we're focusing, focusing on the operating system, but as well as the applications. The basis is the, the system, but the target is everything. As all software can cause performance issues, and for many of them, I need to go from applications, go through libraries and the system call interface, go into the various parts of the kernel to really root cause what's going on. And so that's systems performance. It's a discipline that's been around for a long time. There's been uh, previous books on it a while ago. And I'm really happy to launch System Performance Enterprise in the cloud. Uh, this was written by myself. And there were many, many contributors who I'm very grateful for. And I think some of them are in, in this room as well. Uh, 635 pages, a, a big goal of mine was to make it as short as possible so that I don't waste your time as, as you read it. And so a lot of hours was, was spent condensing it down and condensing it down to figure out just enough what you need to, to know to go and solve problems. I've certainly, I mean, my publisher knows what I can, what I can get through. So my previous book was D-Trace, also by Prince Hall. That's uh, 1,152 pages. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> and Funny enough, it's about the same size. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, they printed D-Trace on very thin paper so that you can carry it around. <laughs> um, they printed systems performance on normal paper. 635 pages plus appendices. It covers background methodologies and examples. And it does differ from pre previous books on systems performance. I'll get into why. The examples, I lead with Linux. And so I used a few different distributions, uh, Ubuntu, Fedora, and CentOS. And I also use a Lumos. So SmartOS and OmniOS, for examples. It's actually great to cover two different operating systems because it gives you an additional perspective to understand the design choices of each OS and of each kernel. And so when you see, if I'm just focused on one operating system and you see various things are done, uh, some, sometimes you can forget to question why things were done. And looking at two operating systems for a comparison is great. It really deepens your knowledge even if you only care about Linux, or if you only care about Illumos, you'll actually benefit from understanding how other operating systems do it, because it will help you understand your kernel better. Uh, the audience, system administrators, developers, and everyone, enterprise and cloud environments. Uh, just briefly about myself, because uh, uh, who actually wrote the book. Uh, I'm currently at Joint. I was previously at Sun and Oracle. Uh, I do debugging of performance every day. And so I am going from any layer of the software stack down to, to metal, sometimes firmware, which is, which is really uh, difficult and, and annoying because I don't have dynamic tracing down there. Uh, previously, I have worked as a kernel engineer. I did the development work for the CFS Ultra Arc. Um, and I've also worked as a performance consultant and trainer. I've written hundreds of published performance tools, probably too many, I, I think. To, to, I feel a little guilty that I've contributed to the problem of having to go and learn all these tools. Uh, I've created visualizations, so heat maps for various uses. I mean, I think, think we're here in the joint office, and, and some of my visualizations I pinned on the wall as I was working on issues, and some of them are here because they're pretty. Uh, we can see some of the visualizations I've created uh, actually around me. Uh, Developed methodologies, the use method and the TSA method, which I was publishing this year and I've come up with books before. So the goals of the system performance book, a, a primary goal for it was to be modern. And so the last real system performance book, I don't know if this is familiar at all, but Slash Performance and Tools, published in 2006, I was a co-author, and we really went through systems performance in a lot of detail. This was originally developed as part of Slash Internal's second edition, but second edition got so big that the publisher was worried about how to bind the book with so many pages. <laughs> and because at that point it was over 1,500 pages. And so we split out uh, the performance and tools section into a companion volume. It worked really, really well. 
this, this, this is the volume you can ca carry around uh, for, pra for, for actually working on issues as a practitioner, and then you have the slice and this volume for reference. But that was 2006, and we haven't had a, there hasn't been a, a, a real systems performance book published for several years, and because of that, we've missed out on a lot of detail on cloud computing, uh, dynamic tracing, new visualizations that we, we're using these days, and also open source has really changed things, and I'll get into more about that in a moment. Another goal was to be accessible to a wide audience, because I want people to really read the book. This is not just about if performance is your day job, it's also for casual users, where I, I just want to go to reference because I have a problem, I'm going to spend half a day on it, and that's it. Help you maximize system and application performance, obviously. Uh, to quickly diagnose performance issues. Uh, for example, latency outliers. And I, and I wrote this separately because with system performance, it's not just about making systems go 5% go faster, 10% faster, 50% faster. Sometimes it's about the latency outlier that's taking one second or 10 seconds. If I'm a big environment, I care a lot about the 5 and 10%. But I know there are many little environments who just don't care. I'm a cloud shop and we have three instances. I don't care about 5%. Like I can just buy a fourth instance. But I do care about latency outlines because that means my customers are unhappy. And so this is about both. And it's different audiences who really care about each. Another goal was to turn unknown unknowns into known unknowns because they're actionable. And so with system performance, there's it's there's a lot of detail, there's a lot of complexity, and when people are working on issues, you work in the boundaries of your own knowledge. And if you just don't know that areas of the kernel exist or the various procedures are possible, you're not going to use them. So part of the goal of the book is to, is to expose you to all sorts of areas, just so that you know that they exist. You may not use them straight away, but sometime later, when you have that really urgent customer critical issue, you know, I've seen that before. There's, I think it was in chapter six of that performance book. Let's go have a look. And so remember as you're browsing this, because it does get into a lot of detail, that a key goal is just so that you're aware of things that exist so you can look them up when you need to. And a shelf life. Uh, working with one of the you know, one of the attributes of a paper medium, this is also an ebook, is that this is going to be on people's shelves for a long time. And I've been teaching system performance for a long time, since 2003. And uh, I used to, used to be an instructor, uh, especially for some microsystems, doing classes in system administration, system performance. Uh, students would expect the instructor to have read every single textbook that existed on the topic. Um, and I was already a bit of a book nerd, so I, I ended up reading everything. Because the instructor can make recommendations to class. It's like, there's so many books on this topic, what should I go and read? And so there weren't various books I used to recommend people would read, including this one, the one that you, that you might be familiar with. That's Asian, okay. Asian Cockroft's uh, uh, book. Is that a Ferrari or a Porsche? I keep thinking. Porsche. 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 Okay. Um, so obviously I'm not as much of a car nerd as, as Adrian is. But, uh, and I'd recommend this book to students, even though it was getting older and older and older by the time I was teaching in 2004 and 2005. And, uh, especially if you open it up and it, and it begins by giving you, this particular edition begins by giving you some very specific recommendations. And so one of my students tells me, told me that ne the adage, never buy a performance book that's more than two years old. <laughs> now, please don't tell my publisher that because he would never publish a book again because they actually need a long shelf life for, for, for the publisher to actually take this on board. But, and I recommended to the student, I said, no, I do. I'm reading this book, and this particular edition at the time was more than five years old, and it's very valuable because performance is a complicated field, and there, there isn't that many times when an expert sits down and writes out all the methodologies that they do, all the approaches that they do, all the, the nuances that they've learned, their experiences. And it's really valuable, even if, if it's five years old, even if it's 10 years old. There's a book, I should have brought, I should have brought it in, but my backpack would have been too heavy, there's a performance book I, I still refer to now. It's Raj Jain's The Art of Computer Performance Analysis, printed in 1991. Fantastic book. I'm referring to it now in 2013. And so that book has more than 
20 years shelf life. But certainly hearing my student tell me, never buy, buy a performance book more than two years old, it's got me thinking, how can we do this? How can we create a, a book that's, that's very useful for people in the longer term? And so that was one of the goals of the system performance book. And there is a way to do it, which I'll, which I'll get into. Uh, although I still think that, as I told the student, I don't think that was a fair, fair thing to say, because I think Adrian's old books, uh, there's also system, uh, system performance tuning by Michael Kittis from O'Reilly, also another very useful book. And so I do browse a lot of these old books for the methodologies and the ideas from the performance experts. But from the onset, my goal was to make, make this book actually have a long shelf life. My personal motivations, I did, did need a good reference for internal joint staff, external customers, uh, and IT at large. Uh, frequently I'm explaining to people the, the inside or outside of joints how to benchmark things and how to diagnose things. And it's been very handy for my previous books, the Dtrace book and Slides Performance and Tools, to say, well, I've written this down, it's documented here, and I really needed a modern reference for everything we're doing in systems performance these days. Also, as a reference for classes, I, I mentioned earlier, I have been teaching for a long time, and I learn a lot from teaching classes. I really love it. In fact, this is something my publisher recommends to anyone trying to write a book is try teaching this to other people because it's harder than it sounds. And when I first started teaching system administration for some, I would say things that I would understand of the kernel and as the words would emit out of my mouth, I'd realize how ridiculous they were and how unresearched mm -hmm. and, and see the pants these things were. It's like, oh, what am I saying? I, I need to look that up and understand it properly. And of course, I've just said it, and the students are like, hey, you just said this. That doesn't seem right. <laughs> so actually, teaching and like, enunci like going through your knowledge and like saying it out loud really helps you paper over any gaps. It, it makes you go and research things because they just sound silly when you say them and, and gives you a better understanding of a lot of things. So I've learned a lot from that. I also learned a lot from the, from the students, uh, the questions they ask. And also a, a type of performance course I like to teach, and, I, and I'm doing this for Joint now. In fact, I have one coming up November 18th on cloud performance. And this is where I set up labs for the students to solve, and I don't give you the answers. And so I'll simulate a performance problem and say, tell me when you fixed it. And I actually create a simulated performance ticket, which says the customer reports that performance is bad for these reasons, Then you run some binary and then you have to go and debug it. It's really interesting because I would think, I would think that, well, I've, I've definitely taught the students how to solve this particular issue, and then everyone will be stuck. It's like, okay, well, I need to change how I'm teaching this, and I need to explain various things. <coughs> and it was really important for me uh, to, to, this has really led into the methodologies that I've been documenting recently, because I got to test them out in classes, I'm explaining to new people, and to see if they can then pick it up and actually apply it to solve problems. So. I'm really lucky that I get to do a lot of real-world things at Joint. I, I didn't mention who, who we are, but in, in case Joint, you do, you, we are a cloud provider. We have uh, SmartOS, which is an OS virtualization, OS virtualize, virtualization for uh, cloud instances, high performance. And we also have KVM for Linux. So I get to do performance for a wide variety of things, but I also get to do research and teaching. So it helps me really study systems performance, but also try it out on people and see if I can help other people learn. So in the book, the table of contents, 13 chapters, uh, and I'll go through some of the highlights. Uh, these sort of chapters probably are recognizable. Applications, CPU, memory, file systems, disks, and network. Uh, that's what uh, a, a formula that has appeared in previous uh, systems performance textbooks. As far as I know, it may have come up the first time it may have been done was Mike Rakitis and his original system performance tuning in a Riley book. And since then, everyone has, has used that resource orientation, oriented division for working through systems performance, which works fine. Uh, I also have a, a chapter on cloud computing, but I do mention it where appropriate everywhere. A chapter on benchmarking and a, a detailed case study, but there are others as well. Uh, appendices, including some, some uh, I use method checklists for Linux and Solaris. And of course, the, uh, 
this is 635 pages, and then we've got 100 plus pages of extra content. So some highlights. Chapter two, methodologies. Uh, this is what, this is what I think people will find is really new and interesting from the book. Methodologies have been described as a, as a, uh, as a black art that is passed from senior sysadmin to senior sysadmin. And it's, I, mean, I remember being a junior uh, system administrator and wondering how to get started and running tools like VMstat and being lost. It's like, what do all these things mean? What, what, what are page in and page out? I don't even know what a, don't really have a clear idea of what a page is, let alone scan rates and deficit and all of these columns. So uh, helping demystify performance and explaining, because running these tools is often jumping the gun and you're going straight to the answers and helping you understand the scope of what we're trying to accomplish, the concepts, the background, the methodologies, and then you start using tools and you start solving problems. Operating systems. Something I've found teaching classes is that uh, some people miss operating system class at university, they've never had that sort of education, and there are lots of really good books on operating system internals. And so like here in the office, if you look around on people's desks, you'll see plenty of copies of Solaris internals. But the problem with Solaris internals is, it's a great book, I love it. I, I helped edit the second edition. It's big. It's around 1,000 pages. And if, if you're a, a sysadmin or doing DevOps or development, it's hard to find the time to read through all of that, um, especially if there's performance crisis and you, need, you kind of need that background right now. And so I took it on board to say, how, how much could I summarize in 30 pages? This is a 30 page <laughs> crack, crash course into operating system internals. And it's kind of something everyone in the industry should read. And I accomplished it, I'm really proud of it actually, a really nice 30 page summary. Uh, and of course I've worked on operating system internal documentation before with Stars internals. Um, this is written in a generic fashion, although I begin by doing Unix in general and then talking about differences between Linux and the Solaris family of operating systems. Uh, chapter six to 10 is the bulk of the, the book, which is the division of resources, CPU, memory, file systems, disks, and network. Chapter 11 on cloud computing uh, and chapter 12, benchmarking. <laughs> benchmarking, it's the chapter that had to, had to happen I wrote it for the good of the industry, and I really need everyone to read it. I've been doing benchmarking now for, uh, for about, I really, really got into it in 2008, and I've been doing it since then, so that's, that's five years. And about, I, I frequently get handed benchmarks. In fact, doing performance at Joint, since we're a cloud computing company, when customers try us out, often the first thing they do is they run a benchmark. And if it doesn't look good, they then say to whoever their rep is, it doesn't look good, we're not gonna go with you. And that often gets escalated to me or one of the other engineers at the company. So I'm frequently spending my life looking at OS benchmarking and almost 100% of the time it's done incorrectly. And so the numbers, the numbers are either completely bogus or they have been misinterpreted because it is actually a really complicated thing to do and a really complicated thing to get right. So. I, uh, I think Adrian, uh, Adrian Cockcroft made some suggestions. I think he wanted me to put that chapter earlier, but um, it's actually quite a dark and depressing chapter <laughs> because I have to drag you through all the all the problems that you may run into, and I was a bit nervous about putting it earlier and, and, and having you like shut the book and think I'm not going to read any more. This is just too depressing. Uh, but it is a chapter I want people to read. It's, it's yes, it is the most error-prone thing you will do in computing is when you're trying evaluate performance. And it's because if, like just to give an example, if I gave you a thermometer and said, check your temperature, and you said, radio, and you stick it in and pull it out, and it says your temperature is 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, you'd say, well, that's ridiculous. That, I can't be 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That just doesn't make any sense. The thermometer is clearly broken. However, with performance, people often grab a tool they've never heard of before. It gives them some number, and they just accept it. <laughs> And it's because they're new to it. It, it, I, it. I understand we're not born knowing how to do this stuff. And so these numbers have, you have, don't have any set of expectations for what, 
from like FIO or Syspatch or Body Plus Plus or iPerf or any of these tools should give you, and you run them and just accept it. So I'm frequently sent these benchmark results where people are saying, oh yeah, my temperature's a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. It's like, oh, something's <laughs> really gone wrong here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's just one of the, the, the things that makes it difficult for people is that you're just new to it and, and you don't have any set of expectations to refer to. Uh, so in a little bit more detail, uh, and I've got, a, I've got a PDF of the book I can browse quickly. Chapter two methodologies. So this, as I said, it's documenting the black art of system performance. And where possible, I do flowcharts and um, give you ways of extrapolating and predicting performance, the capacity planning, or, or whatever. Lots and lots of methodologies. Uh, this also summarizes concepts that you need, statistics and visualizations, like line graphs and scatter plots and heat maps, um, of which uh, there, there are many visualizations elsewhere in the book as well. Uh, chapter three, operating systems. I mentioned that that was the, the operating system crash course you missed at university. And some really basic things like fork creates processes usually. Um, the process life cycle, or the, the pro it's really the thread state transition life cycle. Um, understanding the operating system stack, going through what's inside a process. It's just the 30 pages of background you need to um, work on issues. And, and of course, uh, part of the motivation of writing this is when, I when I've been teaching systems performance classes and, and students start to use tools like S-Trace or D-Trace or Truss and get immediately lost because they don't have that background of understanding what system calls do and understanding what the kernel does. So I don't want to say you must re read a, a Linux internals book or a Slice internals book. So that's why I came up with a 30 page summary. Chapters 6 to 10. Uh, the structure for these is, so this is the, the bulk of the book where it's CPUs, memory, file systems, disks, and network. I will begin with background. I'll begin with terminology actually because part of the, a, a big part of the problem is learning how to talk the talk. But let's go through the terms and the terminology can change from, from context to context. So I'll explain how things sound and how we use the terms. Then go through various concepts and give you enough operating system and hardware internals to work in that area. Then go into methodologies of how you apply that background knowledge. So for beginners, this, these methodologies are forever. Beginners, casual users, and experts. It's how to start and then the steps to proceed. And like I said, I think this is going to be the biggest surprise of the book is that I've really spent a lot of effort documenting how to start for the first time because when I, when I teach people, either I'm mentoring them at work or I'm teaching them in a the classroom, it's the biggest problem. There's so many tools. Where do I start? How do I, how do I begin on this particular performance issue? And then I'll get into the example application of everything you've learned. So how it works on Linux and Illumos, tools, screenshots, and case studies, and then some tunables of the day for, uh, to, to really uh, see the sort of ways that this works. And this structure is very deliberately generic to specific. And this is part of why the book is designed to have a long shelf life, because this stuff won't change for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. It's the example application that will change. And so tools will change. The tunables, which I put right at the end, I mean, there's not a lot of tunables in the book. This is like putting a paper book full of tunables is just a bad idea because it, it took five months to go from the draft and then all the procedures of uh, copy edit, proofs, indexing, um, to the copy I have now. And, and tunables can be out of date in five months. So this is right at the end of the chapter to say, this is kind of the areas you need to go and research. Just to, like, like you might, might not know that disks have controllers that you can log in and tune if you have the right tools, et cetera, et cetera. The sort of things you should look for but don't copy the tunable parameters. You're actually going to have to research your environment and then find out what the point in time recommendations of the day are. So that's deliberate. Uh, starting off generic and then getting more and more specific as the chapter goes on. Chapter six CPUs. This is actually has been released today as a sample chapter. Uh, I've put the URL at the end and 
browse some of it. So I've actually got um, a my author's review copy of the, the book. And so it's so actually just to, to browse some of the so methodology, which I think is going to be it's going to surprise a lot of people. Uh, talk about terminology, talk about concepts, how length, what latency actually is, trade-offs in performance, point in time recommendations, and then getting into everything you need to know, and then getting into this is, this is the methodologies. Generic system performance methodologies, and I actually go through some anti methodologies for reference the streetlight anti method, the random change anti method, the blame someone else anti method, <laughs> which uh, a lot of people tend to do, um, ad hoc checklist method, these are there for comparison, and then get into the, the more uh, productive ones the problem statement method, the scientific method, the diagnosis, diagnosis style, cycle from Brian Ketchell, who documented this a long time ago. The tools method, use method, which I came up with and um, have had that published for a while. Uh, workload characterization, drill down analysis, latency analysis. Uh, I mentioned method R, which is great for comparison. Event tracing, baseline statistics, performance monitoring. Some queuing theory, there are fantastic books on queuing theory, uh, but enough so that you understand that it's turning one of the unknowns into known unknowns so that you know if the time comes. Uh, the sort of things it can help you with. Uh, Static performance tuning, cache tuning, micro benchmarking, and capacity planning. And that's just the generic ones. Each other chapter has more specific ones for their area, like CPUs and memory and disks and network and file systems. Uh, but I wanted to browse chapter six briefly, because this is the chapter six of the sample chapter anyway. And so as I, as I just browse this quickly, you'll see the pr progression from generic down into specific. And so starting off with terminology, and there was a nice glossary at the end, but just explaining what, what does a logical CPU actually mean, or a virtual processor, or a hardware thread, um, just so that we understand what we're talking about. And uh, run queue, uh, dispatcher queue is, is what it's often called in the world of Solaris. At that point, you can then read the text more easily. Uh, some, some models of how things work. Going through various concepts. For, uh, for the CPU chapter, it's actually nice because I, for many of the chapters, I'll go through all the basics to get to take you to the point where you have just a crash course on that topic, and then you can apply performance uh, analysis to it. So, starting off with, so what is clock rate? CPUs have clocks. How do instructions work? Uh, they're uh, processed as an, uh, by a series of functional units, a fetch, decode, execute, memory access, register, write back. Um, why do we have instruction pipelines, increasing throughput, instruction width? So nowadays we're getting up to four wide processors over three wide, so we're going faster. Um, cycles per instruction or instructions per cycle, really important metric, which now that I've explained this concept, you should be able to understand what that's, a, what that's about. And that's a really great performance metric, which is, it's just a number, it's showing cycles per instruction is how many CPU cycles it took to execute an instruction on average. The higher it is, the more memory I.O. or bus I.O. your computer is doing, the lower it is, the more quickly it's going through instructions. And there's a dark area of computers that we're not very good at observing, and that is memory, main memory. So what is main memory doing? We know how full it is, that's capacity. What's the memory buses doing? Uh, especially these days, almost everything is a, is a NUMA environment. And memory locality can be a big difference, and a big performance difference. And when that's not working so well, and you're having to hop over CPU interconnects to access remote banks of main memory, the number of cycles it takes to work on memory can go up and up and up. That can really start to be a performance problem. Just I talk about all this in the book. Uh, CPI is like the first indicator that you may have that type of issue. And it leads to actionable items, like I should be changing my software to do zero copy, or I should be looking at how I can configure memory locality and binding processes to CPUs so that they, they don't walk around, or, change, or changing what hardware I'm buying, and so on and so on. So more concepts, explain utilization, uh, use time and kernel time, saturation, Preemption, 
priority inversion. And uh, for some reason, I, I got excited and did the entire, let, let's talk about priority inversion and exactly how it works. I think I, I was that excited because we worked on a priority inversion issue recently, which, uh, which Brian solved is, is actually quite nasty. It's, I mean, that's where threads can you know, I, I explain a really nasty performance issue where the priorities can end up causing a performance issue because of the blocks that they're holding. Things aren't working so well. Multi-process and multi-threading. So lots of concepts, word size, compiler optim optimization. Uh, now we've gotten past generic concepts. I'll get into architecture, so um, hardware. Uh, just a generic picture of a two-core processor. And then talk about all sorts of other stuff that you get, like the prefetch cache and the write cache microcode ROM, temperature sensors, talking about caches. I know these are old fashioned, but they fit on the figure better. The E dollar, I dollar, D dollar, for the level one, level two cache, and so on. Um, talking about examples. This is memory access latency, increasing the memory range. Um, this is a really nice, and I used LM bench for this. This is a really nice, this is one of the most beautiful benchmarks I've ever done. Uh, and that's where LM Bench has looked at uh, memory access latency, and it has stepped up the size range. So from one to about 64 kilobytes, my memory access latency was very small, about one nanosecond. And then we step up, up to whatever that is, 256 kilobytes, and then we step up to about a megabyte, and then we step up further. And can we guess what these steps are? steps are going to be walking bigger, bigger and bigger caches as you're going, as you're falling out of the, the level one data cache, and then you're going to the level two cache, level three cache, and then main memory. So main memory will be up here, and we can see the caches as we go back down to uh, the level one cache, this would be. What's so beautiful about this, these are, by the way, these are both, log uh, that's, yeah, these are both logarithmic axes. What's beautiful is how even these steps are. And that's the whole point of having these multiple stages of cache. caches. I think I was doing this on an Intel machine. And it's uh, the, the processor, I think the processor designers have been looking at the same thing. And they're like, we need to make the size of the cache and the latency so that these steps are evenly spread so that it has the most benefit for workloads of varying sizes. You know, I got really excited by this. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it worked out so well. Um, so yeah, architecture, talk about how all that stuff works, how the MMU works, interconnects. Uh, secret performance counters is a really fantastic but underutilized uh, framework for understanding stall cycles, uh, how CPU instructions are really working, how they're being executed, uh, understanding level one, two, and three cache, hits and misses, floating point operations, memory I.O. and resource I.O. These are various instrumentable counters on processors that um, in Linux it's the perf tool, in um, Spart OS it's the CPU stat for Windows based systems. So give you an idea. I mean, this is here in the, the architecture of the hardware section because they are hardware. Talking about all of that, giving you some, some examples of performance counters, then getting into the software background. So, how the kernel does scheduling, run queues. Um, how we do voluntary context switches and involuntary context switches. Of course, in Linux, they, they aren't always exactly a queue. You can have trees for doing uh, uh, thread scheduling, but it's not, or task scheduling, but it's, it's similar concepts. Talking about, starting to talk about more specific differences, so Linux and Solaris, um, thread schedule priorities, different thread scheduling classes that you encounter and, and why they exist. And at that point, I've, I've introduced, I've given you a crash course in the, the terminology, the concepts, the uh, hardware of CPUs, and then the software of CPUs, and how the kernel does scheduling decisions in different scheduling classes. Now I can talk about doing something with it. And so now I'll go through methodologies, and this is the methodologies for the CPU chapter. Tools method, use method, workload characterization, profiling, cycle analysis, and so on. Uh, and the tools method is where you just work through the, you have a checklist of tools, you work through them, and then pick the metrics of use. And it's kind of what people do for several. Yeah. And then more, 
effective methodologies like the use method, utilization, saturation, and errors, doing that for every uh, resource, but in here I'm talking about CPUs, workload characterization, um, profiling, some examples, cycle analysis, performance monitoring, static performance tuning. Anyone know what static performance tuning is? Static performance tuning is great. It was, uh, I think Richard Elling popularized it a, a long time ago in a, in a blueprint. It is, oh, you it is where you're looking at not the dynamic performance of your system when a workload is applied, but it's when you look at how is the system configured. So if you turn off the workload and just look at, okay, how many CPUs do you have? Uh, are they cores, hardware threads? Are you single or multiprocessor? What's the size of the CPU caches? What's the CPU clock speed? Is it dynamic? Do you have Intel Turbo Boost? What CPU related features are enabled or disabled in the BIOS? Uh, are there performance issues with this processor model? Yeah, look at the errata sheet for, go download that from Intel. Uh, are there performance issues, bugs with the BIOS firmware version? Are there software imposed CPU usage limits, resource controls present, like you have in cloud computing? And what are they? So none of these are related to the performance work that, that's occurring on the system, the workload. This is just all about how it's configured and how it's set up. And it solves so many performance issues because people just overlook the configuration. And they start getting in, stuck into the how the workload is performing and its performance. And then it turns out, yeah, you're running on the older system. Why are you running on that system? Why are you running on the newer systems and faster CPUs? It's, oh, I forgot to check. I forgot to check that I wasn't on the new system. Or I forgot to check that we still have those CPU resource controls turned on, and that's throttling our performance. That, that methodology is great. I use it all the time, static performance tuning. Uh, priority tuning, actually priority tuning is one of the, that's existed almost forever. But Unix is, uh, for Unix, it has existed forever. It's always provided a nice system call for adjusting process priority. Uh, the, uh, the main page from Unix fourth edition says, a value of 16 is recommended to users who wish to execute long running programs without flack from the administration. <laughs> so, uh, that's always existed, and that's a way I can say these jobs should interfere with the high priority jobs, and they, these can run at a higher nice level, which means a lower priority. Resource controls, which I'll talk more about in other chapters. CPU binding, uh, micro benchmarking. CPU binding did this um, only this week, where it was binding a, a particular customer issue where they had uh, negative scalability. And this is where the more CPUs you, you give them, the worse the performance is. And it's because it's in, it's in lock con contention hell. And they're making such awful forward progress that even though this is actually uh, Pocono, even though it's a, a large multi-threaded application, I thought, why don't we just bind it to one CPU and then take out this lock contention hell and see how it performs. And I know that we're not going to use the seven other CPUs that are there, but let's just bind it to one. It ran 28 times faster <laughs> when you took the application and just bound it to one CPU. Now, of course, they wanted to actually fix the lock intention instead of this very bizarre work workaround. But still, I list it as a methodology. Even if you go with it or if you don't go with it, that's extra information to help you understand the issue. Micro benchmarking, uh, always useful. Another way to, it's, it's another, now I call these experimental methodologies and previous ones like static performance tuning is an observational methodology. So micro benchmarking is an experimental methodology where I can um, run various things to determine how, how fast the CPUs are, how fast memory access is like I did with LMBench, uh, and so on. Then I get into analysis. So at this point in, in these big chapters, gone through all the background you need. I've talked about the methodologies so that you understand what in general you're trying to accomplish. And now I'm going to talk about what tools can you use to accomplish that. Uh, and this is again to, to make this a, a, a long-term reference. Uh, and even though the tools will change, I'll have taught you how to find the tools and, and what you're trying to do with them. So now it's, here's a selection of example tools so that you can accomplish the previous task. And then a lot of these you'd expect to see, and then some of them that you may not. Uptime, uptime prints out the load averages. Um, 
Here I've printed out the, I've plotted the 1, 5, and 15 minute load averages. I've created a single hot thread. And then at the, there's the one minute mark, the five minute mark, and the 15 minute mark. And I can see, so here's the one minute load average, single hot thread. What is the load average after one minute for a single hot thread? This is one, well, it's not, it's like 0.6. Um, and that's because the load average is, this is why I include it, I include it because you think, well, it's just one, because it's the one minute load average. And the term um, average is very misleading, and they shouldn't <laughs> use the word average. Um, they should call it an exponentially damped moving sum, an exponential moving sum, which is what it was called back in uh, the early 70s, you know, where it originated. So, uh, so it's actually exponentially damped. It will eventually hit one eventually get there. But um, you can see that about 0.6 for the 1, 5, and 15 minute load averages, that's where they hit. These, 1, 5, and 15 minutes, it's not the average at all. This is constants that are used in an equation to calculate the exponentially damped moving average. So, and the constants are based on 1, 5, and 15 minutes. But the end result is not 1, 5, and 15. Anyway, maybe I'm getting into too much minutia. Um, I was really excited to find um, this reference about load averages from <coughs> RFC 546. So uh, the 10x load average is a measure of CPU demand. Load average is the average number of runnable processes over a given time period. So an hourly load average of 10 would mean that there's one executing and nine ready to run. Fantastic. And this is a very, very old RFC from the early 70s. Uh, I'll talk about Linux load averages. VM stat, and tools like this, in the CPU chapter, I'm just going to talk about the CPU columns, so user sys, idle, uh, wait, oh, stolen if that column is there as well. MP stat, love MP stat. The CPU, the Linux version, this uh, version for Solaris based systems, I'm always demonstrating it on an Illumos system like SmartOS. Um, SAR, PS, and so all of this is probably what you'd expect to see. At this point, this is kind of the, what you'd expect to see in the performance book, <coughs> going through the tools and what, what, the, what the columns actually mean. Uh, but, it, but there is a lot of background and methodology before you get there. And then getting into more advanced tools. And so Pits data really like Pits data Linux uh, because it, it lets me break down user and system time for processes. The time command, the time minus V on Linux has a lot of interesting breakdowns. Uh, P time minus M on slice based systems gives you the microstate counting, which you can get from PR stat minus ML. And then getting into dtrace. And when I started writing the book, I had the idea of it being very short, being like, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, Josh, you're pointing to. Oh, like my load averages picture? Yeah, thank you. Like, actually, I, I was excited because this, this is actually from the RFC I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's stuck on the wall. I'm so excited to find it. <laughs> this is a, it's like a hand drawing of, of uh, hourly load averages from July 1973 on 10x systems. <laughs> and that was part of the RFC, so this hand-drawn plot of load averages. <laughs> and so when, whenever you see a graph of load, line graph of load averages, we've been doing it for a long time. That's 1973. So uh, I, I should have put this in the book. I should have included it in there. It's part of the RFC. It would be great. Um, first round of errata. The, the first round of errata. <laughs> so when I started with the book, I wanted to cover uh, dynamic tracing is really important for modern systems performance. And it's made a huge difference. Everything's changed. We can now explore anything we want. It's actually part of the reason that I've explored methodologies because previously it would be an academic exercise to say, let's come up with different methodologies for people to follow, like answer all these questions, and there's just no tools to do it. But with Dtrace, you always have that, you always have a way to answer anything you want. So I can come up with a methodology that says, prescribes you to answer these questions so that you can then diagnose an issue. And either they're easy to answer because they're in top or in VMstat or ISTAT or whatever, and if they're not, use dtrace for it. 
So this made a huge difference. And when I started with the systems uh, performance book, I wanted to cover both DTrace, because it's, it's there for the Lumos based systems, Solaris, FreeBSD, MacOSX, and I also wanted to do system tap throughout, um, and then SunPerf, and some mention of, of other ones. And I did one chapter where I did both DTrace and system tab, I did the disks chapter, and it was huge. And the chapter was getting to 100 pages. I was like, ah. And, and for a book that was, that I, I'm really trying to make it as short as possible, I could see breaking the 1,000 page mark, just like the DTrace book, if I tried to do both. Um, and at that point, the, that was about when we started to hear announcements from articles about putting DTrace to Linux. Paul Fox's separate independent project was making progress. And so I made the decision of cutting out the system tap stuff. Coming up with, I left the crash course of system tap in there. And I have an appendix for doing conversions from DTrace to system tap. And so you can survive on system tap, it's fine. But for the examples, so the book didn't have an extra 300 pages, the examples are DTrace. If you end up using system tap, KTAP, LTTNG, Perf dynamic probes. Uh, how many other dynamic tracing things are there on Linux? There's a lot. Dynamic, dynamic tracing does exist on Linux. Um, if you end up using any of these ones, the DTrace examples in the book will need to be ported, which is actually fine. The hardest part about using dynamic tracing is knowing what to do with it. It's like giving you this superpower. You can x-ray anything and answer any question. Ooh. Well, I don't, I don't have any questions. I don't know what to do with it. And so I've taught a lot of DTrace classes, and, and that, that's been the biggest problem for students is, yes, I get it's amazing. I get it's, the, it's the, the greatest thing for decades, but what do I do with it? Uh, actually, that was part of the reason I, I created the DTrace toolkit, was to give people canned scripts that they could go and run to answer questions. So all the dynamic tracing examples, not all of them, but many of the, most of the dynamic tracing examples in the book are DTrace. It's OK if you want to use system tap or something else. You'll need to port it. Um, it may be very wise of me if five years from now, DTrace has finished being ported to Linux. And it's there by default in Linux. And they'll be like, well, I'm glad I didn't make this book 300 pages thicker by finishing the system tap work. So we don't know right now. But you know, that's, the, that's how I've uh, done it right now. Is DTrace is the primary source of uh, examples of dynamic tracing. And I do run a bunch of the DTrace examples on the Linux ports, which are included in the book. What's the status of DTrace and Linux now? DTrace and Linux, two ports in progress. In progress. Pardon? There are two ports in progress, one by Oracle, one by another guy in the UK, Paul Fox. I've used that one a lot to debug issues in the joint lab where customers have issues. And I've replicated. Um, that one will panic systems, and so I cannot run it in, in production. Um, the Oracle one. They seem to be on the right trajectory, and they, they're paying attention to the test suite, but they don't have that um, completed yet either. And so uh, you can actually, Brian Cantrell, who's here in the room, who's the, the, the father of DTrace, you can certainly ask for his opinions as well about how long it will take before it's completely put it to Linux. <laughs> I, would, I would love to have it on Linux, because and as you'll see in the book, it's, it's hugely useful, but uh, those two ports are still in progress. You can help them out. I, I've actually contributed things to Paul Fox, not much, but I've, I've said I, I need this to work and how do you fix this? And it's been pretty helpful. So uh, it's coming along. Yes, the question. Uh, how, port how portable are DTrace scripts? Do they work the same on Solaris and Linux? Um, it depends on how the DTrace script is written. Ideally, they are very portable because they use stable providers, and that's the point. Sometimes I'll need to go into, like this script right here, this will work on anything. It doesn't matter. It uses stable providers. That's profiling CPUs. Some scripts don't, do go and use kernel internals to answer questions, and you'll need to actually uh, flip the, whatever the function names and arguments are from one kernel to the other. Again, that's actually not the hard problem. The hard problem is knowing what to look at. And so if you've got a file system issue, all right, what do, what do I look at in ext4? Well, I don't know. If I gave, gave you 10 ZFS scripts, and said, this is actually really useful, a really useful methodology and approach for looking at CFS performance. You just have to convert, port them to a different file system. You have a pretty big head start. And so uh, these are all examples of the things you can do with dynamic tracing. But yeah, uh, some of the scripts will absolutely need to be ported from kernel to kernel, and even versions of the same kernel. 
but uh, a newer version of FreeBSD, you may have to go back and change some of the scripts to make them work. So, D-trace examples. Um, and this is the CPU chapter, so I've got an example of profiling CPUs, some various one-liners, user-level profiling, and function tracing. This is doing uh, ZFS, ZA checks some generate, so I'm tracing some part of, of ZFS to see how uh, that runs. CPU cross calls, uh, interrupt tracing. Scheduler tracing, looking at uh, how long threads are on CPU for and bringing that out as, showing that as nanoseconds. System tap, um, introduction chapter four, appendix E for conversion. Uh, perf. I did do perf in the C CPU chapter because perf's a really cool tool if you're doing Linux. And perf can be used for system profiling. So it's profiling all CPUs, generate call stacks, 997 perfs. It has its own display. I can convert that into flame graphs. It's easier to browse. Uh, Perf can also do scheduler latency for the CPU scheduler. Perf can also do CPU, CPU performance counters. So here it's actually testing something and giving me the instructions per cycle. Perf can do lots of hardware events. So you, um, depends on the, the processor and, and kernel version how many of these you get. And so you can actually come up with custom things like let's do instructions, cycles, level one data cache load misses, uh, last level cache load misses, data TLB load misses, and prints it out really nicely. So that's a, that alone is the, the, the genesis of uh, Perf was created to do this. But over time, it's, it's gained all these other functionality subcommands, including software tracing. And so uh, there's software events and trace point events. This is probes inside the Linux kernel. And so there I'm using perf to trace context switches and then looking at the call stack to get to context switches. At this point, your eyes are glazing over. This is the, I, I just start with the, the basic tools and go deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, it was really satisfying to document perf, perf because it's a very cool tool and there's not a lot of great documentation on it yet. So um, it's fun to contribute to that. And then CP stack for the, for the Solaris and Lumos based systems to do similar things where I'm getting into the CPU performance gaps. Other tools, there's lots and lots and lots. Visualizations, uh, there's my CPU utilization heat map, which is what you should be using instead of line graphs, because uh, line graphs of average, in fact, I mentioned, tw tweeted this the other day, line graphs of average CPU utilization will hide when you have a single CPU that's hot or if you have uh, an imbalance of CPU utilization. And so I do CPU utilization as a heat map. The line at the top is CPUs that have hit 100%. And so we have software we can click on that and find out the host they're on. That's actually showing 60 seconds of CPU utilization on 5,000 CPUs. And if I did that as an average line graph, it would just be useless. <laughs> can you imagine? On average, your 5,000 CPUs are 5% utilized. <laughs> right. Do I have a problem? <laughs> like, do, do I have some CPUs that are maxed out? Or like, you can't tell. So heat map for utilization, very, very handy. Um, Sub-second offset heat map. You may, be from, you may be wondering when you're using these uh, performance visualizations, at what point? So many of them will show you information at the one second boundary. At what point do, the, do we say, we need to go to half a second? Or a tenth of a second. Like, when does, when does that become a real problem? And I've come up with this visualization which, in some ways, is analog. It doesn't have a fixed interval. And so I'm looking at CPU utilization, but on the y axis, I, I show the offset within a second that, and, and then colorize the pixel based on how many CPUs were uh, online or, or active. And so what this does is it paints strips for each second. And I can see uh, behavior within fractions of a second, and patterns within fractions of a second. And going, going along this, at this point, things are running normally, and then all CPUs go offline. It actually wrapped. There's the next column. 
and then see if this came on, back online again. Normally, since this happened in uh, for, for t second, whatever that is, second 24, 25 and 26, or, normally when you're looking at an average line graph, CPU utilization will just dip a bit and go back up. And you might think, all right, CPU utilization went to half normal and then continued. But by using a sub-second offset heat map, you can see that CPU utilization didn't go to half, it actually went to zero. CPUs all stopped for 900 milliseconds sequentially. And that looks a bit odd here, but uh, just the way it's wrapped and continued. And that is a serious problem. And then this is a problem of, of a lock contention where a lock, a dress-based lock, completely blocked an application for 900 milliseconds. And so all it was a database and all the queries were blocked behind it. And you can identify it from CPU usage, but you can't identify it if, you have, if you're using that one second interval or you're doing uh, utilization. So subset and offset heat map was great. And then flame graphs, which I've talked about a lot, flame graphs do uh, let me look at profile data in, in detail and I can understand uh, where, what code paths are consuming the most CPU time. So then I talk about uh, some quick benchmarking and finish with some tuning just to give you an idea of the tuning options that exist but I don't want to get into uh, you're going to have to you know, go back and re-look at these things as the years go on to find out what the tuning of the day is so that's a quick look at what, what's in one of the chapters uh, I had, had some other things to mention um, chapter 11, cloud computing, was another highlight. And it was actually really difficult because it, I wanted to talk about a uh, comparison between Unix, OS-based virtualization, Xen, and KVM, and how they all worked. And uh, I don't think many people have actually done a lot of performance work on all of them. And so fortunately at Giant, we do run, obviously we, we have you know, normal systems where we have uh, OS virtualization and KVM, and we have run Xen in the past. And so I had a lot of, lot of uh, experience debugging performance on all of them <coughs> and could summarize them for comparison. Talk about how you observe the performance of each, uh, how they actually perform, and how resource controls can be applied. Modern system performance, which I talked about, um, that's what the book does have. And at, at, at this point, this may be pretty obvious, so I'll go through this quickly. And one thing I've done is, this is not, a, uh, there's a lot of documentation you'll see that ki kind of originates from the 1990s. This is where you have like text-based, uh, a lot of text-based tools, limited metrics and documentation, some puff issues can't be solved. Uh, but it's different nowadays, and th the book reflects that, where um, open source is the norm, so we can go and look, how, look up how things work. We can dynamic trace everything to see how they work. Visualizations, like I showed, cloud computing is, is often evolved from that environment, and now we get to do methodologies like we haven't before. Performance visualizations have come a long way since the uh, 90s, and things like XLoad and line graphs. Uh, we're now able to do things like heat maps and flame graphs, so we can really get a lot more detail out. Uh, modern performance analysis tools as well. So nowadays there's a lot. And so I, these are actually slides from other presentations I've given. I've just been updating them. Um, that's the sort of tools you have these days on Linux. And we have our spread of the dynamic tracing tools to look at everything. And then the, uh, the tools for a Lumos. And again, D-Trace uh, can see everything. It's a bit simple because there's only one D-Trace. Mm -hmm. uh, dynamic tracing, if you need it, that, that's an example of the, some of the scripts I've written for investigating different parts of the code. And so, uh, and I do mention a lot of these scripts in the book, just mention them because it's part of turning unknown unknowns into known unknowns. So that you know that this does exist, it is possible, you don't need to know how to do it now, but if there's some crises at work, you know you can look it up and it's a possibility. But those slides are actually not in the book. And people get excited because like, I've done these before and they really like them, but they're not in the book because it's not about the tools, it's about the methodologies that leads you to the tools. And the tools are really the answers to that. So I do have a tool, uh, examples which I showed, but it's more about 
teaching you how to apply the methodologies like the use method, the TSA method, drill down analysis, workload characterization, so that you can solve issues. So that's a quick rundown about what's in the book. Um, and that's, I will, if you find me on Twitter, you can, I will tweet this URL that I've linked to the sample chapter on my blog. Um, you can find me, Brennan Gregg, uh, .com. Really hope you enjoy the book. It's a, it's a fantastic seeding paper. I think we'll be giving out three copies. And I, I hope it is, it is very valuable. Thank you.